through history, men of power have lived in the great homes of England, like Barclay Castle here, reminders of an embattled feudal past. Today, we have different citadels of power. A mere mile or two from a castle where a King of England was murdered 600 years ago is one of the world's first two generating stations to produce commercial power from nuclear energy. Such is the Barclay Nuclear Power Station on the banks of the River Severn. With its sister station Bradwell in Essex, Barclay takes the everyday business of generating electricity into the strange, awesome world of atomic physics. It is new in every sense, and even its apprentices have its layout explained to them by a scale model. They are trained to become the men of power of today and tomorrow. Here in the heart of the reactor building is their quarter deck. This is indeed the shape of things to come, the world of HG Wells. The floor level is the charge floor. The mobile crane that moves over it is the only link between the floor and the reactor, nature's furnace buried far below. Through the crane and the floor can pass up to 40,000 rods of uranium, which go down into the globular reactor to be plunged into a casing of graphite. Then starts the magic breaking up of the uranium atom, causing intense heat. Carbon dioxide gas, driven through the reactor, picks up the heat. The gas then circulates round the water in the boilers, turning it into steam that drives the turbines in the good old-fashioned way. Uranium rods costing over four million pounds do the job that coal or oil do in an ordinary power station. All the while, stringent precautions go on to protect the staff and to protect the reactor from the outside world. This sensitive giant, a sun imprisoned in steel and concrete. This man has the simplest and safest of jobs. He handles uranium in bulk. He moves 30 rods in a container and each of those rods costs 100 pounds. There's the best part of five million pounds worth in the store, all perfectly harmless until the elements challenge each other deep down in the reactor and the broiling chain reaction starts. From the store to the fuel preparation room. Here is a uranium rod covered in magnesium. It's an inch thick, it's less than two feet long. It's the key to the miracle of the world we live in. And off it goes to the loading machine and so on its way to one of the station's two reactors. It's still harmless. The rods can stay down in the reactor for up to three years, and all the time they are being steadily replaced. These rods are not just too hot to handle. That would be the understatement of the century. They are first to be plunged into a cooling bath called a pond, where they will languish for about three months, during which time they will be studied. All these mysteries, and there certainly are mysteries to most of us, are explained as simply as possible to the young men coming into the nuclear power service. Steadily, they move on to practical work, perhaps to the boiler house. There are six, fanned out around one reactor, 12 in all. All the time, top priority is safety and more safety. Boiler men put on their protective clothing. It's all rather like the old ammunition factories, where a man takes 999 extra precautions to make sure he doesn't come undone on the one chance in a thousand, or a million. And in this case, he needs a lifeline. Armed with a light and an air pipe, he goes right down into one of the boilers and carries out an inspection when the flow is turned off. The water and the steam have anyway never been in touch with anything from the reactor and are perfectly safe. The gas which goes round in a cycle of its own could be radioactive, so although it's never likely to reach him, the man is protected. When he's finished his stint, the modern nuclear power station worker goes through his precautionary cleansing routines. He gets out of the gear, he limbers up, he takes a shower to make sure that no dust has settled on him. 
He gives his hands a special test. If he'd had a dose of radiation, this Geiger counter would really rouse the whole department with the sound of bells. It doesn't. Safety inside the strange new world and safety outside. A big thermal nuclear reactor is at least as safe as an Atlantic liner. But regulations demand that the check and double check never cease. They must go on. Out from the power station go the backroom boys into the pleasant land of Gloucestershire, through the peaceful village where many of them live. All sorts of tests are regularly carried out to make sure that the amount of local radioactivity is perfectly normal. A technician, specialist in matters of this sort, calls on a farmer for a milk specimen from his herd. Grass in the local meadows could give vital clues in the vastly improbable case that anything were amiss, so a good sample is taken from the fresh, lush pasture. Plus, of course, a dig of soil for extra measure. And next, a Geiger counter is walked over the land surrounding the station. Back in the laboratory, all these things are recorded, dated and indexed. Nothing is left to chance. This is a world devoted to the perfection of minute detail. Even the grass specimen is carefully weighed. The milk from the local farm is poured into special containers to be stored and studied for the next three months. Instruments record the result of the soil test. Everything goes down in the book. And as a further precaution, everyone, including the new apprentice, gets what he calls his film badge, as casually as his time check. These badges are tested every month. If the wearer has been in contact with radioactivity, the badge would soon show it up. Here, the boiler water pours back into the Severn estuary, perfectly safe. It's played its part in a modern miracle. It's gone through one of the two first nuclear power stations in the world. Seven more are already planned for Britain, which is leading the world in building them. Here are the turbine generators, all perfectly conventional, only the source of the heat is different. The Barclay control room feeds enough power into the national grid to look after a whole city the size of Bristol. Every single uranium rod in each reactor could send a signal to the specialists who study the panels up here. 500 people look after the whole operation, from doorman to chief scientist. All over Britain, day by day, evening by evening, the lights come up. There is a great surge upwards in the demand for power. In ten years, it has more than doubled. In another eight years, it may have doubled again. More and more stations will be built to meet the demand. Seven of them will be nuclear. Not cheap, costly to lay down, but carrying in them bedded down in deep layers of protective concrete, the very sun in fury. That is power, and this is the world of the people of power.